Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Political Forum. I am Mike Jacobson. I'm KTV's Director of Marketing and Communications. And joining me tonight, right over to my left and your right, is State Representative Rob Marwick. How are you today? I'm good, Mike. Thanks for having me here today. Thank you. So you are watching a live call-in show. You see the number at the bottom of the screen? That's the number to call, 312-738-1060, 312-738-1060. If you have any questions, concerns, for Representative Martwick, now is the time to call. We're going to be on for about 25 minutes, so be sure to get in get your calls in. And I'd also like to give a special shout-out to people who are watching online at cantv.org backslash hotline. So, State Rep. Martwick, please tell me. Tell me something about yourself and what's going on in your district. Well, I'm, I'm uh, the uh, newly... Uh, minted state representative as of 2012, so I'm just finishing my very first term in office. And uh, I am blessed to be unopposed this time around. Um, so I'm in my district, I'm really focusing on some of the larger races, trying to help other, uh, other people running for office out and, and just to get, get the general public out to be uh, participating in the process. We have a lot of things to talk about tonight. Obviously, we are less than a week, six days away from election. We can also talk maybe some pension and some other things that are coming up. There's a lot of things. But, yeah. uh, but basically, also, we want you guys to call again. So please call. And the number's at the bottom of the screen. But first, let's uh, let people know exactly how they can contact you. There it is. <laughs> so right there. So basically, right there. So he's at 5433 North Milwaukee Avenue, and the phone number seven seven three two eight six one 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 five. Is that the best way for people to get a hold of you? It really is. Um, you know, we're we try and be as accessible as possible. My office is open nine to five Monday through Friday. We're on Milwaukee, just north of Foster, and uh, you can always uh, send emails or contact us through our website. But call the office. Uh, my my chief of staff Judy is always willing to help people who call and and they get uh, messages to me so I can respond. Very good. Okay, so let's talk elections. Okay, six days away. So there's a lot of things. First of all, that people can uh, can are going to be voting on going in to Tuesday. What what's on your mind? Well, I mean, it's it's the same problem that we face in every midterm election, which is uh, voters decide that they're too busy, they're not interested enough. It's not presidential, um, and yet these elections are really crucial. Illinois is at a crossroads, and and the candidates running, especially for the governor's office, have, have presented a very, very, very different uh, ideas about how our state should go forward. And you know, I'm I'm a purist when it comes to democracy. Democracy only works when people are involved and they play a role in the process. And the best way to play a role in the process is to get out and vote. And uh, it's going to be one of those elections. You think about it, four years ago. Uh, there were over 3 million votes cast, and the election was decided by 31,000 votes. Mm. Mm. So every vote matters. It, that is the smallest of margins. Very good. Now, again, if you have any questions on the election, you can please call the bottom, the numbers at the bottom of the screen, 312-738-1060. So let's talk about some of the subjects that are going to be on, on the ballot when people are going to the polls. Sure. Uh, advisory referendums, for instance. Yeah. Uh, minimum wait. So voters are being asked to increase minimum wage from 8.25 to 10 dollars. Well, voters are being asked to weigh in on the issue of the minimum wage. Um, there was legislation in Springfield that would have raised our minimum wage from 8.25 to 10, but it, 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 there wasn't enough votes for it. So the advisory referendum allows citizens. And again, here's an important reason to go in and do this. If you feel strongly about this issue, make your voice known. I am a supporter of an increase in the minimum wage to 10 dollars. Uh, so when I went and voted, I made sure I voted yes. And it's it's an important way for, for you to tell your legislator that you either support or oppose that issue. Well, it looks like that we have our first caller of the okay. night. Caller, are you there? Hi, yeah. Um, I was watching on the news and you are talking about how in some states voter ID laws and things like that tend to, or they, their studies are showing up that they kind of disenfranchise like young and uh, minority voters. Is that a problem in Illinois? Are there any sort of laws like that on the books or pending? Or how do you feel about that? Well, there there is a, there is a referendum about um, about those sorts of issues. In fact, and I don't have the wording of the referendum. Obviously, the wording of the specific referendum can be uh, quite legal. But 
but in essence, what the referendum says is that Illinois shall pass no laws which inhibit a person's right to access the ballots, uh, to access Election Day. And I think that's very important. Again, it's a way for voters of Illinois to go out and, and, and in unity say, we want people to have access to democracy. We want them to be able to vote without restriction. And so, um, you know, we're more on that side than some of these votes. Like the, the law you probably heard about is in Texas. And uh, in Illinois, we've made several, uh, we've passed several bits of legislation where are actually very different than that. So we passed online voter registration to allow people more access uh, to registering. You don't have to register in person anymore. We allow uh, vote by mail now, which used to be absentee ballots, where you used to have a, had a reason. You had to either prove that you're going to be out of town or that you had a disability. Now anyone can vote by mail. So we're trying to increase access and make voting easier for everyday citizens. Thank you for your call. So there are some other um, advisory referendums that are people are, uh, uh, the voters are going to be asked about on Tuesday. One is about the victims of, of crime. Yes. So you can explain uh, what, what that is about. Well, so the, uh, the Victims Bill of Rights uh, already exists. And what this would do, would, this would amend that, and it would create more rights for the victim. Um, it would create more notice to certain proceedings that go on uh, in a criminal prosecution so that the victims would get more notice and it would give them more rights to appear and be heard in court. Uh, people who support it say uh, that victims of crimes need more rights to make sure they're not intimidated throughout the process. And there are opponents who would say that it will gum up the court system because the prosecution will have to jump through more hoops to accomplish what they want to do. So it's it, it's a tricky one. I support it. I think I'm a criminal prosecutor and I think we need to be very conscious of giving more rights to victims of crime. It looks like we have another call. Excellent. Caller, are you there? Hi, yes I am. I have a quick question for you. Um, after the election, if there's a common consensus among the voters to increase the minimum wage, what is the next step um, after the election? Um, well, uh, advocacy is, is the short answer. What that means is that um, so this is an advisory referendum. It will not change the minimum wage. But again, it's an opportunity for citizens to go out and through the ballots show their elected leaders that they support this issue. Um, that would put pressure on people who don't support the issue to maybe change their mind. We're very close to being able to pass the increase in the minimum wage and a very favorable showing on that referendum may help push uh, some of uh, my colleagues into the yes aisle. And then, of course, once that's passed, we will need the advocacy groups, and that really is citizens calling out, reaching out to the legislators, saying, I support this, I need you to support this. Thank you for your call. Okay, so now another thing that voters are going to be asked about in terms of the advisory referendum is medical marijuana. Yes. So explain what, what, what that's all about there. Well, the, the referendum on medical marijuana would give uh, the city of Chicago more ability to control um, the approval of where dispensaries and um, where uh, uh, growing centers would go in the city. Um, it would give them more zoning control over this to deny or approve applications. When the law was written, there was a concern because of the nature of medical marijuana you know, it's a political hot button issue. Yeah. There was concern that since this really was in Illinois, this is not a California type law where we're just giving marijuana to anyone. These are for very, very serious uh, illnesses and, and for the treatment of them. And so the idea was to make sure that there were dispensaries available throughout the city so the people that really need access to this as a form of medicinal treatment would have the ability to access it. So that's what that one's all about, is giving the city more control over that process. All right, so if you have a question about elections, we've talked about elections so far. We've talked about voters' rights, minimum wage, medical yeah. marijuana. What questions do you have, election or non-election? Call us, the number at the bottom of the screen, 312-738-1060. It looks like we have about 15 minutes left in the show, so make sure that you call in and let us know uh, your thoughts or concerns, please. So. Moving forward, this uh, this might be a, a difficult question to answer, you know, rather quickly. But or, well, actually, no. But before that, let's hold that. Um, the, the, that's going to be a nice little tease for later. We have a call. Caller, are you there? Yes. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. How you doing? Good evening. You know, I'm so glad you brought that part up, the medical marijuana. Instead of uh, uh, a vote 
the siege so how should it be handled through the city seemed like there should have been a vote us voters to vote on whether should we have medical marijuana and and i think a lot of people choose not to have medical marijuana around especially if say for instance you're a landlord if you own a few buildings you know, some tenants, they do not. They do not want to smell that. Now you got to make some kind of preparation if it is passed and say someone is in the building. And if you have a six, you know, six apartments and just say five people don't want to smell it, now i got to make an arrangement to, well, go in the basement, make a, a, a something. I, I just don't know what I'm going to do with that. So it seemed like that should have been a vote. Uh, I'm not trying to make ways, but it's just a question. So let me get out there so I can hear your response. And thank you for being so honest in taking this question. Thank you. Happy to do it. Thank you. So uh, it's a tricky question, and, 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 and I appreciate your, your concern. What I would say is that there are many things that, that we consider as referenda and many things that we don't. Um, there are uh, this issue is a very tricky issue as i said when i went into it i might have been predisposed to think that having been a former former prosecutor maybe we should tread lightly about legalizing marijuana but we didn't legalize marijuana what we did was we passed a pilot program which means we're going to test this for a number of years and see if it works and the idea was to provide um in and, and this was not an easy decision to come to but we had loads of testimony about people who came in and they talked about these are the most serious serious physical ailments most of them are terminal and this gives medical marijuana gives people treatment that is so much less uh so many less of side effects yeah. than like the opiates that are already approved so it's less harmful and more beneficial and it just made sense so uh that was something that i was happy to support but thank you for your concern about that Thank you. Caller. It looks like we have yet another call. Caller, are you there? Uh, hello. Uh, my question is this. Uh, the Water Reclamation, um, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, there are nine candidates for three positions. I have no idea what those people do or how one would go about, other than following a party line, uh, choosing the three best people to be commissioners on that group. Thank you very much for taking my question. Yeah, that's a really good question because a lot of times there's a lot of, of things that are on the ballot that may, many voters don't know about. Right. Uh, there's no doubt. And, and I think everyone has, a, a, I should say there are many groups that have a process for this. So obviously, um, there are newspaper endorsements, although in this election, those the, the sanctity of those has certainly been called into question um, by some of the things that have gone on. And I'm not going to get into that. But uh, the parties do have an endorsement process. So... I'm a member of the Democratic Party, and I say that only to, so that I can explain. We go through an endorsement process where we choose who we feel are the best candidates, and, and we feel that that's our way of trying to educate our voters. Um, what I would tell you about the Water Reclamation District is that it's an extremely important position. And as you said, most people don't know about it. This is, um, there's a, a Reclamation District commissioner who likes to say, think of me when you flush. And that's... That's no small, it's a joke, but it's no small thing. You think of all the millions of people in greater Cook County area, and you think how often they flush. They reclaim that water, they reclaim flood waters, they treat them, and they return them to the lake. So what they do is extremely important, and it, it's, it's a huge budget. So we should be very careful about who we pick. What I would say is educate yourself. Get on the Internet, read the newspapers, find out, ask your neighbors, talk to people like me who know candidates who are running and, and see if you can come up with an informed decision. Do we have another call? Yeah. Must not. So let's move forward now. So um, something a little, a little more louder getting off the elections and we're talking about O'Hare noise. That's Ooh. been a complaint. Uh, have you received calls about about the about O'Hare noise and, is, and what, what can you do? I do. My mother calls my office at least once a day to complain about the airplanes <laughs> overhead. And I'm not kidding. Um, no, I, I do. I live right under one of these flight paths, as do my parents, only they are probably four miles closer to the airport. And when those planes come overhead, uh, you, you, you can see if the pilot has a mustache or not. I mean, 
it's very close and it's very loud and it's 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 we joke about it but it really is no laughing matter people's lives have been terribly upset by what happened at O'Hare what happened well for those of you who aren't affected by this they reconfigured the runways and they changed two things they changed the volume that is over one particular runway and they changed the trajectory of the flights coming in meaning they're coming in lower uh, than they were before so they're over more people's heads for a longer period of time at a lower altitude and it's been extremely extremely disruptive and people are very upset about it um, there's a group called the Fair Allocation, uh, uh, excuse me, the Fair Coalition, which advocates for the fair allocation of runways, saying, hey, we understand O'Hare's got a lot of traffic, let's spread it out. Let's everybody bear a little bit of this burden, not just one little flight path. And um, we've been working uh, very closely. I was one of the, I was the first elected official to join their group and advocate on their behalf. And since I've done that, there are so many that have joined the cause now. Uh, most importantly, because it's a federal issue, Congressman Quigley, Congressman Schakowsky are, are there advocating with the Federal Aviation Administration. And, and hopefully, uh, we're going to get a new flight study, a new noise study done, new contours, and hopefully get some relief for some of the people in there. And now, another issue that's uh, on a lot of people's minds, we're talking about the state pension. So, a bill passed last year yes. that was challenged. So. Uh, can you try to explain to people w what happened and what's happening now? Okay. Um, very simply, uh, so there was a bill passed, and it, it, it's titled very loosely Pension Reform. But re in reality, so that we're very clear about this, it's, it's not really pension reform. It's more of a benefit diminishment, right? We don't have the money to pay the benefits that are promised, so we change a bill so that it says, well, now we're going to pay you less, right? Um, I oppose this bill because I felt that if the employees who were promised a certain benefit, if it was going to be diminished, they should at least have a voice in the process. And I felt that they were not given an adequate bargaining position at the table. And, and I support that. And, and so I voted against that bill. Nonetheless, it passed. The governor signed it, which means it became a law. But it was immediately challenged in court. In Illinois, we have a constitutional protection that says that we can't diminish benefits. So we passed the bill, and I say we, the legislature, mm -hmm. uh, passed the bill with an idea that we could get around that constitutional provision or protection. Um, they're suing on it. We're waiting for the court to make a decision. If they decide that, that what we did was constitutional, then the benefits will de be diminished according to this plan, and there will be savings associated with it. If they find out it was unconstitutional, we'll be back at the drawing board, and we'll be starting from scratch trying to figure out a way to get out of this financial problem. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, we still have about, oh, I'd say about eight minutes left in the show. If you have a question, comment, or concern for Representative Martwick, please call below the number 312-738-1060, 312-738-1060. I'm going to show once again how you can contact Representative Martwick. There's the information right there, the phone number 773-286-1115, and you are at repmartwick.com. That's me. Very good. So let's now discuss. Well, let's discuss something that is also on on that's uh, an issue, I guess. A three percent surcharge on income claimed over one million dollars. Uh, yes, this is another referendum that's on there. Um, it's another referendum that I support. Um, basically, what this says is that there was a bill again that we did not have. We fell one vote short of in the legislature that would tax. Income claimed of a million dollar, more than a million dollars, an additional 3%. So currently we're paying a 5% income tax across the board. If you make $10, you pay 5%. If you make $200,000, you pay 5%. If you make a million, you pay 5%. What this bill says, every dollar that you make more in excess of a million, mm -hmm. would there would be an additional 3%. So you'd be paying 8% on every dollar over a million. That money would then be diverted to education uh, because we have been woefully short of our obligation because we're broke. So this is a way of raising revenue from the sector of our economy that has had the most growth. They've had exponential growth in their wealth over the last 10 years, while most everyone else in the middle class and lower classes has actually decreased their income, uh, real income. Um, in fact, I saw a study where the average or the median income in the United States has actually decreased by six thousand dollars over the past ten years mm -hmm. and and that's that's crazy to think that you're, you're making six thousand dollars as a family median that means half the people in this country 
are, or more are making less than $52,000 a year for a family. And uh, so, so this is a way of saying, look, our economy has been very kind to those at the top. Mm -hmm. And we're asking you to pitch in so that we can give those of us at the bottom that have not prospered at least opportunity. Put that money into education so that those kids have an equal chance to be successful like you are. Because the argument is uh, when you're talking about business, when you're talking about raising minimum wage and, and charging uh, you know, millionaires more taxes, that they're just going to leave. Yeah, well, and, and I understand that argument. I think it's a, I, I think it's a legitimate argument, although I disagree with it. I, I think that um, that is from the school of top-down economics, that if, if we allow the rich to be richer, then the benefits will trickle down to us like manna from the heavens. I disagree with that. I think that the best way to improve our economy is to give opportunity, good-paying jobs, quality education, and, and a stable lifestyle to people at the low and middle incomes, they will spend the money because they've got it in their pocket and they're in a good situation, and the manna will rise to those that are producing. Looks like we have another call. Caller, are you there? Hi, thank you for taking my call. You know, it feels like the state has been broke for many, many years now. And I was wondering, will this tax on the millionaires... Or is there a way to cut costs or find a sustainable revenue source so that we can start going up? I just feel like we have been either declining um, and essential services have been cut. And I, I just wish that we can find a solution to our financial problem. That's a, that's a fantastic question, and thank you for calling and asking that. And yes, I do believe there is a solution to our problems. Um, we are in a financial mess that, that really was, oh, it's probably 30 years in the making, and that's no joke, and, and I've only been there for two years, so I'm, I'm not taking any blame for it. But I think we're on the right path. We've begun paying down our backlog of unpaid bills. We've been paying down our debts. We're on the right track. The reality of it is, is that the federal government or excuse me, our, our state government is not the federal government. We don't get to print money. We don't get to manipulate interest rates. We are a big checkbook. We're like your checkbook at home. Money in, money out, and we have to balance. And right now, I think that we need to do certain things to make sure that we have a stable income, and then we have to make good financial decisions going forward. And I think one of those really comes down to something that has been on the forefront for a long time, which is the progressive income tax. And I think we need a progressive income tax in the state of Illinois like we do in the federal government. As I said, the growth in our economy has been at the very wealthiest uh, income levels, and they pay, as a percentage of their income, substantially less than all the rest of us do. A progressive income tax would equal those scales. It would capture growth in the economy where it's growing. And it would allow us to reinvest into the things that really matter in our community, schools, streets, uh, police protection, you know, all of the things that matter in the neighborhoods. And then what that does by investing into these neighborhoods is it gives the people that live in middle and low income neighborhoods an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And what is America if it's not the land of opportunity? We're not America. We need to make sure that everyone, no matter what your income level is, has the same opportunity to be the next Mark Cuban, the next Bill Gates. Everyone has that opportunity, and that's the way that you do it. All right, so it looks like we're just about to see, getting at the very end of our show, but I want to ask you something that this is now in your hood, in the neighborhoods. There yes. is some kind of rivalry between what is the real Six Corners, Portage Park, or is it Wicker Park? Well, the fact that you asked that, Mike, means you you really need to brush up on your Chicago history because the only real six corners is in Portage Park. That's the six corners intersection that historically has always been uh, uh, referred to as six corners. I know the hipsters down there in Wicker Park feel like they want to lay claim to it, but uh, well, we can debate that, and, and uh, I'll step up for six corners anytime. The real six corners, Portage Park. Let's show um, uh, the way for folks to get a hold of you one last time. So if you need to get a hold of Representative Martwick, there is the information right there. He's on Milwaukee Avenue, North Milwaukee Avenue, 5433. Uh, phone number 773-286-1115. And you can also check out his website at repmartwick.com. And he's also, I believe you're also on Facebook. I am. I'm, I'm there, uh, Rep Martwick on Facebook. And, and 
Yeah, find me and communicate with me. I, uh, democracy works when people reach out and help me. Uh, give me your input. Give me the the way that you, give me your thoughts on these issues, and then it helps guide the way that I make my decisions. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me, Mike. And it's thank been you, a pleasure. Sylvia. Yeah, thank yes, you thank so you, much. Sylvia. Great job taking all the calls. Yeah. And thank you, callers. So we appreciate you tuning in and calling in tonight. And tune in next week on KTV 21, 7 p.m. Until then, have a good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.